Hello everyone, welcome back. Just a quick follow-up to our previous episode on nocturnal visitors like raccoons and deer. Our customer care girls have a message for you. So if it's not raccoons, but rather deer visiting your feeders and emptying them during the night, and if it's not possible for you to hang your feeders out of their reach, maybe you can switch to a different type of a bird feeder, a feeder where deer will have a hard time reaching in and emptying it completely. A Niger feeder will work because the openings are so tiny only birds can extract the seed, and then a nut feeder where you can serve shelled nuts or dried fruit, and again, the way it's built, deer will have a hard time getting anything. And then there is another visitor, bears. Unfortunately, nothing is really bear-proof. Over the years, we've received tons of videos from all parts of, you know, Canada and US. We've seen bears climbing high decks, climbing trees, knocking down poles, tearing down clotheslines. No matter what you do, if a bear is hungry or if a mama bear brings her cubs, they will get to that uh, bird feeder. So our recommendation, if you live in bear country, just take your feeders down sort of for the summer and then in the fall when bears go to hibernate, you can put them back up. This is actually the best time of the year to feed birds. Glenn Michaels has been feeding birds for years. He lives in Maine. And this winter, at the end of December, he's leaving for three months. So he's worrying about his birds and is wondering how to wean them off his feeders. Hi, Glenn. You're not alone in being someone who feeds birds and being a snowbird. My wife and I spend part of the winter in Baja, Mexico every year. And we have a feeder arrangement on our home in Vancouver Island as follows. We've got two brome feeders offering shelled peanuts, one brome feeder containing suet cakes, a cage within a cage feeder bearing suet cakes, and a four foot long four by four with drilled holes to provide suet to big woodpeckers like the pileated. I prefer this arrangement because it attracts a wide variety of songbirds which stay on the feeder for lengthy periods, because it leaves less mess below the feeders, and because the food lasts longer. We generally keep these feeders filled throughout the fall before heading south, and then again in the spring upon our return from Mexico. I don't keep them filled during the warmer summer months if only because the birds seem to be enjoying their natural foods then. So in the fall when heading south, I generally let the birds empty all of those feeders and by the time October rolls around, the birds get the message and subsist on natural foods in the area. Or do they go to the feeders of neighbors who don't go south in the winter? As for our five feeders for our numerous non-migratory hummingbirds, we tend to get them up and going and running as soon as we return from Mexico and keep them going till about two weeks before we leave for our winter home. The bottom line with all this is there's no need to worry about your birds while you're gone. They'll find alternative food sources. The trick will be to convince them to return to your restaurant when you come back north. You know, working here at Brome Birdkin has actually changed my whole approach to shopping, Christmas shopping in particular. Because our bird feeders are built to last and we back them by lifetime care, I cannot help but look for products and companies that have a similar philosophy to keep as many of our Christmas uh, gifts out of landfill as possible. And since most of my friends and family already have Squirrel Buster bird feeders, I'm looking for other options. So what's on your Christmas shopping list? Can you help me out? In the last two decades or so, divorce among bird pairs is being found to be more and more prevalent. For example, one in 10 geese pairs break up to find new mates each year. Today, the phenomenon has been discovered in a number of bird species, including warblers, sparrows, and even swans. The concept of mating for life has mainly been attributed to large seabirds like penguins and albatrosses. But recent research by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute provides new evidence that all is not well in the idyllic world of the albatrosses. In their study in the remote Crozet archipelago in the Indian Ocean, the team found that 13% of wandering albatrosses divorce during their lifetime, and not just because of low numbers of females, but also due to aggressive home-wrecking males. Some bird species, like penguins, have been known to engage in adaptive divorce to ostensibly gain a better mate and produce more young. However, this most recent study in albatrosses did not find that divorcing one's mate ended up in a greater production of young which supports the idea 
that the birds are not actually choosing to divorce. In fact, couples are being driven apart in what is being perceived as to be a forced divorce by aggressive males, something that's never been seen before in the bird world. In a series of behavioral response tests, the scientists found that old females were no more likely to divorce than timid ones, but that shyer males had higher divorce rates, suggesting that bolder males may be forcing the more timid males to break their pair bonds. This phenomenon may be partly driven by the skewed sex ratio of the albatrosses in this remote population. Unpaired females are rare because apparently more birds of this particular sex die being trapped in fishing equipment and thus the population is skewed towards males, including a few rogues which aggressively break up pairs to gain a mate. Can you think of a bird that starts with an X? We couldn't, that's why we skipped letter X, only to discover that there is a Xanthus hummingbird that happens to live in Baja, Mexico, where David overwinters. So I reached out to him and I asked him to do a little report on this interesting hummingbird. And now it's letter Z, another tough one. So we did a little bit of research and there is one bird that starts with the letter Z. It's a zone-tailed hawk. Not a very widespread hawk. We'll never see them here in our area. Some of their populations move to breed between March and October to southwestern states like Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, a little bit of Nevada. I was sure I saw one of them on one of my trips to Nevada. But I was uh, quite far away and these birds are often mistaken for turkey vultures and common black hawks. So if you know of anyone who's looking to study a bird species, zone tail hawks have plenty of openings. There's still so much unknown about them. As you can see, they're of this beautiful black color with the white stripes on there tails. Uh, from a distance, they are often mistaken for turkey vultures. It is actually believed that uh, zone-tailed hawks have adopted turkey vultures' flight behavior to fool their potential prey. I guess it's only us humans who have really noticed turkey vultures' bold and pink head. Both sexes look similar, but females are almost 10% larger and their courtship behavior is quite elaborate. As for their diet, it's pretty standard for a hawk. Birds, uh, squirrels, chipmunks, lizards, and lots of quails. You know, when I was watching a uh, gamble's quails run around when I was in Nevada, I actually wondered if they were a popular menu item among any birds of prey. And yes, zone-tailed hawks are quite fond of gamble's gambles quails. Adults would often bring decapitated prey to feed their young and males tend to fill the nest to the brim to make sure that there's enough food for a day or two. All right, everyone, it's time to wrap up and do all that Christmas shopping before it gets too late. Next episode, we reserved S for Santa, of course. And please come check out our photo contest because the captions that are rolling in are just hilarious. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.